the five tactics that we have, right? The nutritional piece, the exercise piece, the sleep piece, the distress management piece, the drugs and supplements. Those are your tools to affect change. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is enhance longevity. That means delaying death by delaying the onset of chronic disease and then enhancing health span by enhancing that exoskeleton, cognition, emotional health. Each of those four axes require very deliberate attention. The, the not dying part requires attention. Um, and, you know, basically you're going to die. If you're a non-smoker in the developed world, you're very likely to die from atherosclerosis, cancer, or an accident. Those are, and again, you can dive into what those accidents look like. This is where you see an intersection with physical, the physical centenarian Olympics piece, right? Is, you know, what's the leading cause of death overall? It's accidental death. But when you start, when you leave that to people who are in their ninth decade or eighth decade, it becomes accidental falls. Mm -hmm. So a fall becomes a more likely cause of demise when you get older. And, you know, as you sort of alluded to earlier, it's not always that you just fall and die. It's usually that you fall and you break your hip and the broken hip results in immobility that very quickly begins to spiral your quality of life and you end up in the nursing, you know, and all these other things. So so it's fighting all of these, these you're sort of fighting all these fronts, which is why I, I think one should be paying attention to every possible tool they have to make this change. You know, again, I think with nutrition, I like to take a big step back and say, what are we talking about here? So. I sort of start at one side and I say like there's this thing called the standard American diet and I think we can all agree no matter what your dietary bent is we can all agree the standard American diet is not a good diet. Um, I don't I don't think we need much more evidence of the no. futility of that. So then the question becomes how would you escape the gravitational pull of this thing? And in in my practice I think there are two ways there are two techniques to get people out of that pull. Mm. Um, one of them is dietary restriction. And dietary restriction is anytime you restrict some element of the diet, taking away some part of the what. So you're not really restricting the when and you're not restricting the how much, but you're restricting the what. So this has the largest number of things in its bucket, right? So this is a low carb diet, a low fat diet, a Mediterranean diet, a paleo diet, yeah. a vegetarian diet, a vegan diet, blah, blah, blah. There's you, I, you know, you need scientific notation to count the number of things that fit in that bucket. And they all get termed diet, which I sort of, sort of don't find t typically appealing. Um, the second major way to get people to escape the gravitational pull of the standard American diet is time restricted feeding, where you don't restrict explicitly what they eat or how much they eat. You just restrict when they eat and you begin to compress that window of feeding. And those two things are not necessarily done in isolation. You can then start to combine those things and say, well, if, cause we're going to see any form of dietary restriction, almost without exception is an improvement over the standard American diet, which is why I sort of get a kick about these warring feuds that exist in these camps. My paleo diet is better than your vegan diet and blah, blah, blah. And we, the, the answer they is like, work. they're <laughs> both infinitely better than yeah, what you were yeah, doing before. Right. And by the way, they can both be infinitely idiotic, right? So you sure, know, the paleo brownie and the vegan cookie are equally bad. So, um, so, but you can take the best of both worlds. You can take sort of the best of dietary restriction and combine it with time restricted feeding. And then you get an even more potent tool. And then you move from there into intermittent fasting where you take these periods, you know, in my opinion, sort of three days is the minimum effective dose. Five days is probably the sweet spot. Seven days is, you know, also with benefit and totally doable. And you either fast in a um, complete way, which is my preference personally to just water only for those periods of time or in a hypocaloric way. So Prolon is one example of that. It's a it's something called a fast mimicking diet, I think is their trademark name for a hypocaloric five day fast. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's an infinite number of permutations and combinations to how you would go about doing intermittent fasting. Um, and, and again, we we usually by the time a patient's been with us for about a year, we are really pushing them into that world where they're, they're going to be spending some time doing that. We, we reserve the term um, intermittent fasting for fasts of three days or longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, or if not outright fasts, hugely reduced caloric intake. One of the challenges, remember how I said if I could be czar for a day, I would change dinner time? Yeah. Like I, I haven't eaten yet today. 
And I know that that's actually not great for my circadian rhythm. It's actually, I'm going to pay a little bit of a price when I sleep tonight. Cause let's say I eat dinner at seven tonight and I'm going to eat more than I normally would. And let's say I go to bed at 10. I just know that my body works best if I've got a much bigger gap between when I eat, especially a large meal and when I sleep. So no, I don't think everybody should do this every day. And in fact, I like to mix it up quite a little bit. And I actually, I really love to mix it up and reverse it and sort of do all of my eating early in the day, especially.